Hey YouTube, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to do a teaching on Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles, please open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, specifically verses 18 through 32. So while you're doing that, I want to take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. So I'd like to start out with just simply reading Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, and then we're going to identify and define seven things done by people who suppress God, and then we'll be discussing three ways in which God gives them over to their sin. So Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The word of the Lord says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Whew, what a list. I certainly don't want to be on that list. So Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 32 gives us a very sobering warning about suppressing God and the consequences that follow for people who do. Seven things people do that suppress God are... They abandoned truth about God. They failed to worship God. They failed to give God thanks. They failed to give God glory for his creation. They claim to be wise. They worship idols. And they insult God. People who know the truth about God and yet don't glorify him are in grave danger of being, of being given over to despicable things such as evil thoughts, uncleanliness, and confusion. We must always keep in mind that one of God's most severe judgments is when he simply just gives us over to the sin that will ultimately destroy us. He says, you want to do that? Fine, go for it. That's one of God's most severe judgments. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9 talks about how we as Christians are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And when we look at how this section of scripture starts, we see that it starts with, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against 
all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do the things that are on this list. We need to give God proper thought, affection, and our utmost love and devotion. And we need to ask for his help to do so. I always like to ask God to tune my heart to his. In this video, we will explore and define the things that we must avoid doing and a few ways in which God will give us over if we do. This awesome creation that we live in gives us no excuse not to give God worship. Since I have grown in my biblical worldview, I have grown to appreciate all of the fruits, vegetables, spring water, and funny looking animals that God made. I know that God loves the look on my face when a bird flies over my car and I praise him for it and give him thanks. You know, it's kind of like when you blow bubbles at a little baby. The baby's like... Verse 21 speaks of people who are not thankful to God. These people take for granted their families, their beds, their jobs, their food, and every other good thing that God gives us. They start to have a futile thought life, meaning that they entertain the evil thoughts that they have. You know, every human being on earth struggles with having evil thoughts. So when it comes to evil thoughts, always remember that you can't keep a bird from flying into your hair, but you can keep it from building a nest. Let me say that again. When it comes to evil thoughts, always remember that you can't keep a bird from flying into your hair, but you can keep it from building a nest. So it's almost like when you, I, I was counseling somebody one time and this person was struggling with wicked thoughts and they were really, really troubled by the thoughts they were having. And I simply asked them, okay, so do you agree with the thoughts that you're having or do you disagree with them? The person said, oh, I absolutely disagree with those thoughts. I despise them, but they just pop into my head. I said, that's a good sign. If you have evil thoughts and you disagree with those thoughts, that's a good sign because a bad sign would be is I'm having evil thoughts, but I agree with them. I'm entertaining them. That's letting the bird build a nest in your hair. So once they start to entertain these wicked thoughts, verse 21 says that their hearts were darkened. Once their hearts were darkened, let me start that sentence again. Once their hearts were darkened, they then lost control over their mind and intellect, resulting in confusion. Verse 22 says that they thought they were wise, but in reality, they were fools. I think three good examples of suppressing God are people who believe in naturalistic evolution and space aliens, even though they study biology and cosmology, and those Christians who do not live a life of holiness in front of a watching world. They kind of just take God's grace for granted and they think they can just live any way they want. That is suppressing God. Verse 23 gives the next step in the downward spiral. These people were actually starting to worship idols made in the shape of created things. Some people build shrines to worship in or worship in front of rather than living their life as a form of worship to God. Many others trade the relationship that they should be having with God to have a relationship with their pets. Now, that's not to say that pets are bad because we all love our pets. And the Bible says a righteous man cares for his animals. But anything that a person gives their attention to that they should be giving to God is an idol. Anything that a person gives their attention to that they should be giving to God is an idol in our life. This can be careers, cars, people, collections, or even a spouse and children if they put them before God. God wants to be numero uno in our life. And if God's number one in your life, all of those other things will follow and flow out of that relationship. Verse 24 gives the end result of their unthankfulness and lack of worship toward God. God gave them over to uncleanness. Again, one of God's most severe judgments is to simply hand a person over to the sin that so easily ensnares them and they become unclean. 
These are things like homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality, fornication, adultery, and pornography. There are many other ways to dishonor our bodies also, such as drug abuse, alcoholism, cutting, cross-dressing, and these are just a few that I can think of off the top of my head. There's a lot of other things too. These are shameful and vile. Now, I'm of course not talking to the person that struggles with and hates their sin. I am talking about those who embrace and celebrate their sins. There are some people who struggle with these things, but they hate it and they're fighting against it and they're begging God for help. And then there are others who actually embrace them and celebrate them. Two different people entirely. So we must always remember that there is hope and restoration for us who call out to God for help, even from the midst of his judgment. So often in Christianity, we try to fix people's problems rather than getting to the root. The root of our problem is that we're sinners. We put labels on people such as drug addict, alcoholic, adulterer, gay, lesbian, overeater, alcoholic, and such things. And then we put them into little groups based on their sin. What we need to do rather than putting labels on people and placing them into little groups is we need to put us all together in the same room and teach ourselves in God's word how to give glory, honor, and thanks to God. If we were to get our eyes off of our problems, off of our sin, and put our eyes back onto God, we would see his love for us, his holiness, and realize that because we love him because he first loved us. So we need to take our eyes off of sin and put our eyes onto God. Out of this love, lives will be restored by God. Now, I'd like to read a section of scripture. Open up your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We saw how Romans 1 was an example of uh, ways, bad ways of responding to sin, actually embracing them and celebrating them to the point to where God gives you over to it. Now, I want to show you in Psalm 51 if an, an example of King David when he sinned, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then to cover it up, murdered Uriah the Hittite. When Nathan the prophet went to David and exposed his sin, David repented. So on the flip side of Romans chapter 1, Psalms 51 is how we should be when we sin and we repent towards God. Psalm 51 have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt, off burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Verse 18, 
Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So when we sin, we're supposed to repent and have a broken and contrite spirit, and God will forgive and restore us. We're not supposed to say that our sin is okay and actually embrace it and celebrate it. So those are two different polar opposites. You got the people that are doing the things in Romans 1, and you got the people who, like David, when he sinned, had a broken and contrite spirit and wanted to be restored by God. Got his eyes off of his sin and onto God. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.